Good day to our viewers and a, a big welcome to you. This is a very unique opportunity today that we have in front of us. I am Larry Myers. I'm currently the chair of the Rotary Peace Fellowship Subcommittee for Rotary International District 6270. And today we have the wonderful opportunity to speak with uh, our current uh, uh, District 6270 endorsed Rotary Peace Fellow, who is right in the midst of her program at International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. Her name is Nicole McNevin, but rather than my introducing her or telling about her background, uh, we have a fellow Rotarian in the district from the Rotary Club of Nina, Betsy Roselle, who also happens to be a close personal friend of the McNevin family and of Nicole personally. So I'm simply going to turn it over to her. And uh, Betsy, thanks for serving as interviewer today. Thank you, Larry. This is a unique opportunity to actually be able to speak in person uh, with our Peace Fellow. Uh, I know for the Rotary Club of Nina, this is our first time ever endorsing a Rotary Peace Fellow from our local area. So it's very exciting to have this, this exclusive Peace Fellowship um, go to somebody from Nina, Wisconsin in the United States. And I'm going to jump right in and just Nicole, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions because a lot of people are curious about the Peace Fellowship and how it all works. So let's let's kind of start with the actual process of becoming a Peace Fellow, okay? Take you back to before you were a Rotary Peace Fellow. Based on your experience, was it very difficult to apply to become a Rotary Peace Fellow? Yeah, hi, I just want to give a greeting to everybody. Thank you for watching, if you're watching. Um, as you've heard, my name is Nicole McNevin, and I am a Rotary Peace Fellow, so I have uh, gone through the entire process and gotten into the program, and now I'm just finishing up my, my first semester. So uh, to answer your question, Betsy, yeah, um, it's a lengthy process that you have to put a lot of thought into. I think I personally spent between like 20 and 30 hours, like writing the essays for the application, proofreading the essays for the application and getting feedback on essays for the application. But um, relative to comparable programs that offer uh, competitive scholarships like this one, I wouldn't say that the Rotary Peace Fellowship is specifically difficult or a specifically large amount of work. Um, so it's definitely doable. Um, it just takes um, a really genuine effort on your part and a really genuine effort to uh, respond to the questions um, from your heart and from your own experience. Mm -hmm. Because you already lived in Japan when the opportunity arose, I'm curious, was the Rotary Peace Fellowship on your radar at all before I mentioned it to you? Um, I knew of it, but really up until the point, Betsy, where you suggested applying to the fellowship uh, to me, I didn't really know anything about it because Rotary is not... Um, as vocal of an organization in Japan as it is in other countries. Okay. Well, and even here, I think, Larry, you can attest to this, that for the most part, most young professionals in the United States probably are not familiar with the Ro Rotary Peace Fellowship Program. Is that a safe assumption? Every year, it's a yearly cycle. So every year, uh, the Rotary Foundation offers up to 80 master's degree programs at five Rotary Peace Centers throughout the world and uh, up to 50 uh, certificate programs for two Rotary Peace Centers in the world. One of those was just closed down, but they're opening up another one in Istanbul, Turkey mm -hmm. within, within the next year. So for the master's program and also for the certificate, no, it's not widely known. We do our best to try to contact uh, local universities and colleges and to try to let especially graduate students know. Uh, Nicole has not mentioned it yet, but uh, each of these two programs for Rotary Peace Fellows require a substantial amount of experience. Uh, a number of years are required uh, for the, the area in which you hope to be working. 
so it does require professional experience before one can even apply. So mm -hmm. let, let me shut up though, so that we can hear Nicole talk about it. Yeah. Right, Nicole, expand on that work experience requirement and how you fit that requirement. Yes, so the Rotary Peace Fellowship requires a number of years of experience in um, peace-related work, um, in development-related work, um, in order to qualify for applying in the first place. And so how I spent that, I was a teacher on the JET program in Aomori, Japan. Um, and how that um, contributes to peace building work is that it's um, primarily a role that is meant to um, increase mutual understanding through English education and uh, having the JET program participant share their culture and uh, share their values and also uh, adapt to Japanese culture um, and learn about um, Japanese values and working in a Japanese workplace. And usually these, uh, the JET program will send uh, selected participants to rural Japan, um, which are usually in need of support um, and support for their educational systems. Um, so that was a role that I fulfilled. And then additionally, I had one year of experience in the United States in a nonprofit organization, um, which uh, involved um, leading high school and middle school aged students um, around the city of Louisville, uh, two places that served people struggling with homelessness, poverty, um, refugee status, disability, et cetera. Um, so I had uh, quite a range of experience in work that would be considered peace building. Um, and that's how that requirement was fulfilled for me. Um, and really a great uh, four years of experience for me that I'm putting to use in this program. That's great. That's great. So you chose, I know the International Christian University in Tokyo was your number one choice if you were mm -hmm. chosen as a Peace Fellow, fellow which you were. What makes the program uh, in Japan or, or at ICU unique around the world? I'm curious as to how they were even chosen. So what makes them unique? Yeah, that's a great question. So I see you, like, even apart from its Rotary Peace Center and apart from the Rotary Organization, like it has a peace building mission. Okay. And so for all of the undergraduate students, whether they're Japanese or from abroad coming in, um, their entire educational curriculum is centered on making them peace builders in the world. Hmm. Um, and then on top of that, um, you have the liberal arts nature of ICU. And I think that really makes the program at International Christian University unique uh, because at least for me, um, I really, obviously I'm interested in uh, peace building work um, like all of the other Rot Rot Rotary Peace Fellows. But you have people in my cohort who are interested in conflict resolution. You have people in my cohort who are interested in agricultural development. And then for me, I'm interested in um, promoting, continuing that work of promoting international exchange in Japan, I mean, in rural Japan specifically. So I'm able to focus my peace studies degree on education. Um, whereas the people who have other more specif specific interests are able to uh, shape and craft their own degree in that way. And so I would say that those are the two points that really make ICU stand out. It's that it is a university that is committed from its founding and from its from the base of its curriculum to peace building for everybody and its liberal arts nature. Well, you had mentioned your cohort. And I have been able to see pictures that you've posted of your cohort. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about some of the members of your cohort? I think there are 10 of you, right? 10 mm -hmm. Peace Fellows. Uh, so what shocked me is 
that many of them are a lot older than you. I didn't understand that most Peace Fellows are actually, you know, probably over 30. I was assuming, um, you know, wrongly so that many were under 30. So can you kind of give us some backgrounds of some of your cohorts and where they're from? Yeah, of course. We have a lot of countries represented in the ICU a Peace Fellows cohort for uh, 2025 graduation. Um, so yeah, as you said, only two of us are under the age of 30. Wow. And the other one who's under the age of 30 is also from Wisconsin. Which, which is, is just which is huge. just bizarre to me. There are 50 around the whole world and two are from Wisconsin. You know, mm -hmm. go Wisconsin, right? Yeah, right. I was very excited to hear about that. Um and she's great. And uh, uh, apart from her, I believe we have one other American man from South Carolina, I think. And he served in the armed forces. Um, and he's interested in peace building in Northern African countries. Mm. Um, um, besides the three of us who are from the, oh no, we have four of us who are from the United States. I apologize. Um, and Besides the four of us from the U.S., we also have representatives from uh, Tanzania, from uh, Nigeria. Um, we have people from Colombia. We have people from Liberia. Really a diverse selection of countries all over the world and diverse ethnicities as well. Um, and then in the other uh, piece Rotary Peace Fellow cohorts who are a year or two ahead of us, you have even more countries represented. So it's really a diverse community full of diverse backgrounds and diverse interests. Um, we have people who have worked for the UN. We've had people who've uh, had years of experience in post-conflict situations. We have people like me who don't have as much experience in um, perhaps like global countries in the global south, but we're still interested in contributing to a peace building in perhaps like rural areas or impoverished areas of uh, our own countries. So it's really a an amazing experience to be surrounded by people who can speak to so many different aspects of the world and so many different places of the world. And it helps inform your research and it helps inform who you are as a person. Oh, for sure. It, yeah, it sounds exciting. Now with all of you coming from all different countries, I understand that most of your classes are offered in English, right? Do you, mm -hmm. now is everybody required to take the classes in English or is Japanese also required for all of you as students? Put simply, no, Japanese is not required. In fact, most graduate programs in Japan itself don't require uh, Japanese hmm. in order to get into because graduate school courses are often taught in English here by professors who have English as a first language or have studied it for many, many years. So I would have to think the fact that you're fluent in Japanese helped to make your application stand out, right? Yes, absolutely. I think um, because for the Rotary Peace Fellowship, you're not allowed to apply to a university in your home country, correct? Right. So the people who are actually interested in research in Japan um, are few and far between for the university. Um, and so I do think that having a research interest based in Japan, uh, accepting me, made a lot of sense to the program directors because to them it's like, oh, ICU has everything that she needs and she has a lot of things that uh, perhaps the peace program needs um, here at ICU that we've been lacking in the past. So I think that that really did help to contribute to the acceptance of my application um, by the ICU Rotary Peace Committee. I can't speak to the international 
committee that um, was also in charge of the selection process. But mm -hmm. So you talked about your research, right? And I'd love to have you expand on that a little bit more. So right now, you're taking obviously the the classes, the fresh or the freshman, the first first year of your master's program. Are you already involved in some research? And what will what does that research look like? What will it look like next year? Great question. So um, right now, I well, I came into the university with the uh, objective to study how a study abroad can be made more accessible to kids in lower income areas of Japan. Um, because right now in Japan, you're seeing a disinterest in foreign countries among the youth all across the country. And that's a huge problem for Japan because it has an aging population and low birth rate crisis. And so they're really struggling to adapt their systems to a globalizing world. And the Japanese government has the goal of, um, I believe, oh, they want to increase the amount of outgoing exchange students significantly by the year 2030. Um, and they're looking for ways to uh, open up access to a greater degree to these students and to make the uh, process itself more desirable to them. So that's what my research is focusing on. And I was a little bit, um, cloudy, hazy, I guess, on exactly how I wanted to go about that. But my advisor that ICU paired me with um, is Japanese, and she's in the education department, and she has years of experience studying uh, development in African countries. And she also has years of experience coaching students who have researched in Japan and East Asia. So after talking with her about it, I was able to settle on a more concrete process led by um, well-established theories to work on what I'm currently um, endeavoring to, towards right now. And what that is, um, I am going to be um, asking the students themselves for their opinions on what is holding them back from being able to pursue a study abroad experience? So just last month, um, after nailing the process down in more concrete ways, I was able to travel back to Aomori, which is where I lived for four years before um, moving here to Tokyo for my degree at ICU. And I was able to talk with the head of junior high school English education in the Aomori City Board of Education. And he told me um, that if um, the work was approved by ICU and ICU was willing to work directly with the Aomori government, they would be able to distribute a survey to all of the ninth graders and 10th graders in Aomori City at all of the schools. And I would be able to collect their survey responses and analyze that data um, with the help of ICU professors and look for trends in what might be holding students back from pursuing these international exchange experiences and what um, the students who actually want to pursue these kinds of experiences are doing. Um, and if those trends make themselves clear, which I believe that they will, you'd be able to present those results, obviously as a part of my thesis to the ICU the thesis evaluation committee, but also to the Aomori City Board of Education and perhaps make some concrete changes which could um, 
provide some support and help in this area for those students. So that's what my research is looking like right now. Okay, and so that research, I would assume then would be applicable to like Rotary International for our exchange program, um, maybe AFS or the myriad of other exchange programs out there then, right? Because it can't be just um, um, the, the, that rural area, is it Alamori or how, how do you say it? Al Aomori? Yeah, Aomori. Aomori. It can't, they can't be the only rural area that struggles to, to engage mm -hmm. students, right? So do you, do you picture then replicating this work in other rural underserved areas and underengaged areas in the international exchange? Yeah, absolutely. I would imagine that the trends that make themselves manifest in Aomori would also be present in some way or another to other areas of Japan of similar income levels and um, a similar socioeconomic status. So I'm also working with Rotary in Japan, and I've been able to potentially just open up some doors there too, because a lot of this issue actually sits quite close to the hearts of a lot of Rotarians in Japan too. Like, how do we increase these numbers? Um, and they are very willing to work with me. They've made more than obvious and clear their willingness to work with me in this um, in order to uh, A, make good research and B, focus on really the concrete ways that that access can be opened up. Yeah. So that is also work that is being done with Rotary. And I imagine that um, other exchange programs would also benefit from it. That's neat. You were telling me when we when we spoke a different time that your the Rotary Club you've been assigned to, so to speak, through the Peace Fellowship Program is two hours away from campus, which is kind of unfortunate, but that you're you're in high demand being that you're fluent in Japanese. All these Rotary Clubs want you to come and speak with them, right? How do you manage this that rotary circuit, if you will, and having your host club two hours away from campus? That's a very good question. I personally think that um, if you want to contribute to rotary, you will find the time in your schedule as a peace fellow. Um, and I'm taking a lot of classes, um, but for me, the benefits of being involved in Rotary here and the amount that people are able and willing to help me really makes all of the trips and all of the speaking presentations worth it. Um, and just meeting these people who have so much valuable insight and so much experience, like it's great. And because I've additionally, because I've contributed to their foundation and their organization, like I'm getting invited to basketball games, I'm getting support in a lot of different um, material ways too. Um, I'm getting business connections all around the country, like it's really, really great. Um, and so in addition to that, I know that because of the language barrier, because Japanese is not a requirement for participants of the ICU peace, Rotary Peace Program, there does tend to be a language barrier between the fellows and uh, the um, Japan Rotary Program. And there are, a, like, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of English speaking professionals in the rotary circle. So people are usually fine. People who, um, people are assigned counselors who speak fluent English and can help them out with their life in Japan. Like, don't get me wrong on that. But not everybody speaks English in the rotary, uh, in the Japan Rotary Foundation. And so for some of them, it's their first time speaking to someone of my cohort wow. and actually finding out about, finding out in more detail about the program. And they're always so glad that this exists. And they're always so happy to provide things and provide the help that they can. And that's been a really great experience for me and definitely um, a benefit to speaking Japanese. So even though it is busier for me and my support or my um, contribution to uh, Japan Rotary is does take a lot of time and a lot of effort, 
I feel like I get equal uh, support back. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so I'm glad you've been able to squeeze that in among your busy classes. I'm, what does your average day look like? Like what will Monday look like? What kind of classes and what will your day look like? Yes. Yeah, so it's going to look different for every Peace Fellow. Okay. I know that uh, some people live further away from campus. A lot of people um, have a heavier course load. People have a lighter course, course load. But for me, um, I live about three minutes from campus, a three minute walk from campus. And I chose that strategically because I knew that I really wanted to be taking advantage of my first a, my first master's degree and be able to get as, spend as much time um, studying as I really can. So my, I usually get up at five and I study and I go to class at about nine in the morning. Um, I'll have a two hour class in the morning. I'll come back to my apartment. I'll eat lunch. I'll go to an afternoon or an evening class. Um, there's a gym on campus, so sometimes I'll work out. Um, in ice in the ICU area specifically, compared to the rest of Tokyo, we have a lot of forests. We have a lot of nature trails. Um, we have um, a lot of biking and running paths. So I might go out for a walk or run just to, you know, release any anything that's going on, and then I come back. I eat dinner, I study more, and go to bed. And my weekends might look like a speaking event at Rotary or going out to um, one of the districts of Tokyo that has a lot of shops and restaurants and being with friends. Um, it might look like attending a uh, lecture that ICU has opened up to its students. Um, I know that the other... A couple of weeks ago, I went and had a conversation with the um, ambassador to the to Afghanistan from the Red Cross, and he talked about um, implementing a new healthcare system in Afghanistan. Um, before that, I listened to a um, person from to a PhD student from Thailand who was presenting their research on how. Uh, the problem of statelessness in Japan can be alleviated. There are so many opportunities that ICU and the staff at the Rotary Peace Program provide you with that can um, really keep you busy on the weekends if you want to be. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, you're, it sounds like you're getting exposed to a lot of people with that worldwide experience. I love it. Um, so you see what some of these people are making careers, you know, they're making careers out of their piece mm -hmm. work, right? Do you have any vision for five, 10 years from now, what an ideal career for you would look like in this space? Is it going to be more corporate in nature, do you think? Or, I mean, obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but I know we need peace, we need, we need peace builders in the corporate world as well as in the nonprofit world. What, what is your vision for your, your career following the master's program? Yes, so I'm very interested in continuing uh, my role in education within Japan, um, and specifically international education. Um, that's an area that I'm really passionate about and that I've always really been passionate about. And whether that looks like a nonprofit role or a corporate role um, or a government affiliated role, I'm open to all of that. So. I don't have, as you said, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have at this point a step one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, but there is demand for that in Japan and in the United States. So, and I'm from the United States, obviously. So um, I think that that will open, this um, graduate degree will open doors in both countries and um, enable me to pursue uh, that capacity in a lot of different ways. Oh, for sure. Um, tell us about what a, a couple of your cohorts hope to do with theirs, uh, or a couple of members of your cohort, because you have people from all over the world, right? Has mm -hmm. it, have any of them shared specifically what they want to do following their master's program? 
I do know that a lot of people hope to go on to the United Nations. Mm. Um, I know that there are some who are interested in either pursuing or continuing um, a previous role in the corporate sector. Um, a lot of them want to live abroad. A lot of them want to live in areas that are apart from the countries that they came from um, and continue peace building work in um, the countries that they were perhaps working in before they got accepted to this program or in entirely new countries. So it's really, uh, the sky's the limit when you're talking about what you can do with the degree. Yeah. It's very exciting, and oh, we know you're going to to do great work no matter where you um, where you land. But it's it's really exciting for us as Rotarians to know somebody's really trying to create a lot more opportunity in that international study exchange area, and you know particularly in the underserved areas. So we'll be watching. We'll be watching for your um, your data analytics and what you know, what you're finding. Um, just to, to kind of wrap it up, I'm curious, do you have any, do you have a hypothesis on uh, why these students in the rural area aren't as apt to apply for an international exchange program? I think it has, personally, I think it has to do with access to information and a lack of mentors, authority figures, and family who go abroad. Because I conducted some pre-research through a Japanese class um, on campus at ICU, and I talked to students at ICU who went on study abroad programs when they were junior high school students or high school students. And they all had this common thread of relationships with people who were either from abroad or lived abroad, studied abroad for a certain period of time. And in Aomori, you just don't have that. So I think that it's not so much that they have zero interest in study abroad. I just think that they have a lack of access to information about it and a lack of people that they've grown up watching who sure. have fulfilled a role in an international capacity. Um, yep. So that's my theory. That's my working theory right now. Okay, but, interesting. Um, that makes I'll sense. Do you, do you yeah. know what kind of relationship the, the rural Rotary Clubs have with the high schools there? Is there much outreach? I do not know because when I was a teacher there, I was in the elementary and middle school systems. Okay. Um, so I don't know the extent to which uh, the Rotary program works with high school students there. I will say that when I was giving a speech to the Aomori Rotary Club before I left, um, I believe I was the only person under 30 in the room. Okay. So I don't know if you can really draw judgments from that. Um, but that's never been the case with a uh, Rotary Club in Tokyo, which I think has a little more uh, diversity in numbers and a little bit more um, concrete outreach strategies. Um, yeah, I would. That could have just been one day, so I don't. I can't really say anything concretely. Sure. But I would assume that's going to be part of your research. Also, is where are these students learning about opportunities, whether it be from Rotary or AFS or wherever the exchange programs are. You know, do yeah, they absolutely. have a connection? Right. Because it'll be helpful for all of these sponsoring organizations to better learn what we can do to reach out to those underserved areas. I mean, we we can safely safely say that most of the students we've had from Rotary um, from Japan have been from the Tokyo area. You know, they've mm -hmm. not been from the rural area. Um, they've been from Tokyo. You know that you hosted an exchange student too. You've hosted two Japanese exchange students. They were from close to Tokyo, correct? Yes, one was from Tokyo and one was from Kobe, which is close to a hub of major cities down south in um, the Kyoto, Osaka area. Okay, so larger cities, right? So I think yes. it's, it makes sense that most of our exchange has been, you know, with students from the larger cities. So um, so it'll be just really interesting to watch your research. Um, are the classes you're taking right now very relevant 
to that work or uh, like what are some of the classes you have right now? Yes. Yeah, so again, with ICU's liberal arts nature, it's really easy to kind of customize my degree. Um, but yes, so I'm taking rotary core courses, which have to do with peace and development. Um, and development is obviously very relevant because you have international exchange and you have study abroad. Um, and that brings about a level of internationalization and globalization, which are controversial in the um, area of development. And so it's very useful for me to study about the issues surrounding that topic um, and think about how this could potentially economically, how, how increasing numbers of study abroad participants could actually concretely affect um, these rural or these more rural areas of Japan. Right. Um, at the same time, I'm able to take courses in the undergraduate department um, in Japanese um, with education professionals. So I'm able to study Japanese education. Um, and this year, this semester, I should say, I'm actually going to be taking a counseling course um, that's centered around um, Japanese children and Japanese youth. Um, oh, cool. So I find a lot of the uh, courses that I'm able to take and required to take uh, very relevant to the work that I'm going to be doing and to the research that I'm doing. I um, mean, there's just enough diversity in there, too. There's just enough of a gap um, to give me new perspectives as a young professional. Um, that I feel like I'd be able to implement and bring a fresh perspective to the field that I am hoping to go into. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Are most of the your the co or your fellow students in the Rotary Corps classes peace fellows? Is that is that what the class is made up of? Is primarily peace fellows like you? Yes. So all of the peace fellows are required to take um, two courses. Um, but you don't have to take them together. It just depends on the year that you want to take them, whether year one or year two. Um, but there are also other students, both Japanese and non-Japanese, who take these courses because they're part of um, their electives for peace studies majors. And we do have a lot of people outside of the Rotary program who major in peace. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, so you're getting to, I mean, even even among fellow students, the learning must be rich just culturally, right? Oh, absolutely. And also just, it's such a great experience being around people who don't have English as a first language, you know? Um, and you have to find ways to understand each other and communicate and stay humble because you don't always know if, how you're receiving a person's words or opinions are actually how they intended them. So you have to leave that kind of a space and you have to leave that kind of an empathy gap and ambiguity gap. Um, and just being in this program is really um, a way to uh, hone your cross-cultural understanding skills. Um, and I have found that to be a very rich experience. Yes. Really? Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, Larry, you can, Larry, it's no surprise why Nicole was chosen, right? <laughs> based on, based on listening to her and your, and, and Nicole and your passion for this work and for peace and for, for building cultural bridges. We obviously want from our district to be able to send more peace fellows in the future. So kind of, if you, if you were able to kind of coach students in the United States on how to find out about Rotary Peace Fellowship programs or why they should apply, et cetera. What, what would you tell them? Well, as far as finding the information on the fellowship, I think it's um, quite, um, it's made available on Rotary's website. Um, and anybody, I think, in your local club um, would either know directly of it or know somebody who would have a lot of information on it. So I think you could either go through the internet or through your local Rotary Club to get more concrete information about it. Um, 
But as far as considering applying for the fellowship, I think that if you are interested in conflict resolution, uh, peace building, development, uh, cross-cultural understanding, basically any of the things that I've talked about up until now, um, the Rotary Peace Fellowship is a great way to do all of that. Um, and it's a, a full ride scholarship, right? So you're really, the benefit of that is that you're really able to just focus on your work. Um, and you're really able to just focus on your studies and commit yourself full time um, to uh, this work that you might want to do while you're in the program or in the future and or in the future. Um, so I think if those are things that you're interested in, like it's a no brainer, like absolutely apply for the fellowship. And even if you don't uh, get in, you can apply a number of times. You can apply multiple years in a row. Not everybody, like I'm kind of an exception. Like I, I think again, the alignment of my research interests with the fact that the university that I selected for my top pick was in Japan. I think that was kind of a unique combination, um, which allowed me to get into the fellowship so young. Um, but you have a lot of people who apply uh, multiple years in a row and then they uh, get it once they have um, these years of peace building experience under their belt. Um, and in any so in any case, it's a useful application process to develop your own ideas about why you are in what you are in the work for, mm -hmm. um, because the questions that they ask on the application are also very thought provoking and deep. So I would absolutely recommend it to anybody who's interested in deepening their uh, wisdom, knowledge, and experience uh, when it comes to peace building, conflict resolution, development, and cross-cultural understanding. Great. And about the logistics. Now, you mentioned it's a full ride scholarship, but mm -hmm. what about your living expenses? So if I'm, you know, if I'm a 40-year-old and I've had a lot of peace experience, but I don't have a lot of money, and now I would have to somehow fly to another country to start my master's program, but gosh, that's expensive. You know, tell me about the logistics. What what expenses does Rotary cover for the Peace Fellows? So they cover the flight from your home country to the country where your university is. Oh, okay. Um, so they covered your your eleven hour bus trip then, right from northern uh, the northern so Japan. They would have, but I actually flew back from Japan to the United States to see my family That's because right. the JET program also offers to cover your flight okay. um, from Japan back to the United States. And then Rotary was very kind. The Rotary Peace Fellowship was um, uh, offered that um, option. Well, I guess it, like it's an it, it is an option, but like who wouldn't take the option? <laughs> you know, like right, they cover right. your flight from your country of origin to uh, whatever the country of whatever university you're going to. Okay. Um, and then you, everybody got a year long stipend deposited into a Japanese bank account. Okay. Um, and those were the living expenses. So the living expense stipend that you get deposited into a Japanese bank account is enough to cover your rent it's enough to cover food. It's enough to cover um, your just daily living expenses. And on top of that, many fellows find it more than enough to be able to uh, travel around Japan and sometimes to other countries. Like there's a group of us who are wanting to go to the, um, com the Rotary International Conference in Singapore this year. And the fellowship, depending on how you budget it, is enough to cover a trip like that as well. Um, on top of that, on top of that um, living expense stipend that you get, all of your tuition fees are automatically covered uh, for the school. Um, so you don't even have to worry about that or think about that. Like that's just automatically covered. Um, and then you also have your required applied field experience portion of your degree, which occurs for my program in the summer, because that's when the Japanese summer break is. And in addition to all your uh, living expenses being covered and your tuition being covered, you get um, 
it depends on the Peace Fellow and the nature of the work. Um, but you get your expenses paid for that portion of your degree up to seven thousand U.S. dollars. Okay. So the good news That's it sounds like is that you is that you don't have to have another job. You can, like you said, focus totally on your degree and your work, your piecework. So that's wonderful. I mean, because I would have to think that it's a concern for somebody who would be wondering how much this could cost them even with the tuition paid. So thank you for spelling the logist the financial logistics out because that that's that makes it even more attractive, I think, for somebody who might be afraid that it would be too expensive to travel abroad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yes. I will. Okay. I will interject here. the The Rotary Peace Fellowship is one of the most lucrative fellowships in the entire world. Mm -hmm. It far surpasses the United States Fulbright program. Wow! Uh, when uh, Nicole finishes this program, she will be among a very, very limited and unique number of individuals who will be known as Rotary Peace Fellows, and she'll have the opportunity to join their alumni association. Uh, it is currently estimated that, at least for Japan uh, and ICU, and the Rotary Peace Center's programs do vary. They differ from country to country. But the one in Japan is uh, not just a year or a year plus a summer, it's 22 to 44, 22 to 24 months in length. And so it is estimated that the US dollar value of that particular program is about 100,000 US dollars. Uh, that's wow. about what it amounts to. So um, it, it, it's a very prestigious and uh, helpful program. I mentioned earlier five Rotary Peace Centers. Nicole indicated that uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, you, you have to go outside your country. There is a Rotary Peace Center at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. But if you're a U.S. citizen, you cannot attend that one. Um, there is, of course, the one at ICU in Tokyo. <clears throat> there is one at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. There is a Rotary Peace Center at Uppsala University in Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, there is a Rotary Peace Center in Makerera University in Kampala, Uganda. And um, I'm trying to remember if, if perhaps I missed one here. I, I don't think I did. I think that was five. I think that yeah. was, yeah, and that's five. The, the one in Thailand was just shut down. I, I should mention that the one in, 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 um, in um, Uganda, you actually have to be a citizen of an African country. Oh. Uh, that, that one has been open only for a year. So they just had their first cohort. And um, in, in Nicole's case, since the program at ICU is, is two years approximately in length, there are always two cohorts that are present. And there are typically eight to 10, depends on how many get accepted, but eight to 10 in each one of the cohorts so she actually has the opportunity to get acquainted with the, the cohort one year ahead of her. And then she'll have an opportunity to meet the new people coming in for next year. In January, we will start the new cycle of applications for uh, the, the next group of students. And that will be advertised throughout uh, uh, our Rotary District 6270. And we're hoping that we get a number of highly qualified candidates who will apply for that. And um, as, as one can see, uh, Nicole was and is a highly qualified candidate. And we look forward to seeing what she does with her program and making contributions to peace resolution, conflict resolution, conflict prevention throughout the world, wherever this program happens to, uh, to lead her. And when she's back in Wisconsin, we hope to make use of her. But of course, with Zoom and other technology, you can always make use of her rather than having her physically present. So we would encourage folk to uh, make connections with her. Uh, by this time in the recording of this interview, I will have, once I've edited it, put up the link for the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program of Rotary International. So all you'll have to do is, is follow those links 
and you can get the information for the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program. Um, and and my question then to, to you, Nicole, would be for individuals who might think that they're interested with regard to the actual application process itself. Would you have any tips or how would you mentor someone who says, uh, Nicole, you're a Rotary Peace Fellow. You're in the midst of your program. What what would you what would you say to me as I do my application that I want to I want to be a successful applicant? What tips do you have for me for my actual application? Anything at all that you could tell that individual? Yeah, that's a really great question. I say first and foremost, be honest and be genuine. Be yourself. Um, talk honestly about your experiences. Um, and what has led you to apply for the fellowship. Two, I would say, think about your audience. Think about who's reading your application and what kind of a person they are looking for. Because it's obviously what you can do and what you can do to for the world, but it's also how you're able to align that with Rotary's values and um, how they're going to be reading your application. Um, and if I could add a third one, it would be really think about the university that you're applying to and how uh, you, because as I said, you're going to have ultimately the decision left up to an international uh, board of uh, people who are looking at your application, but the university itself will also advocate for you and look at what fellows they want to potentially have in their cohort. So think about, so be genuine, think about what you can bring, not just to the world vaguely, but for Rotary International, think about what you can bring to the university um, and frame all of your experiences in terms of those last two. So that's how I would advise people to fill and, out and the it is a, it is a fact <clears throat> that each one of the Rotary Peace Centers embedded in a an international university, such as ICU in Tokyo, each of them has a unique aspect or unique aspects to their programs. And so depending on what you want to do in your career and what experiences you have had, you really need to investigate each one of those Rotary Peace Centers, those universities, and try to make a match for yourself. And you can do that online also uh, by mm -hmm. going to the individual universities. They will each have uh, a, a website devoted to their Rotary uh, Peace Center, and you can do it that way as well. So, mm -hmm. well, we're Larry, almost getting... I would like to I would like to encourage Rotarians around our district to seek out really good candidates. You know, I approached Nicole. I contacted her. In fact, I think it was a couple of years in a row, Nicole. I think the first time it wasn't the right timing for you. And I, a year later said, oh, Nicole, I know you'd be a great candidate. You know, just <laughs> like when we invite people to join Rotary, they're more likely to join our club. You know, how did, how did you join Rotary? Somebody invited me. The same thing is true about the Peace Fellowship or any of the other programs Rotary has. We need to do the inviting. So you know, hopefully I didn't badger you too much, Nicole, but I really knew you were just a really great candidate. And I, and you know, highly encouraged you several times to apply. So, so I appeal to other Rotarians to, to seek people out. We, it's a very, like Larry said, it's just a very exclusive, it's an honor to be a, a Rotary Peace Fellow. I don't know how many we've had from our district, Larry, do you know, in the last 50 years, how many very, people? very, very few. I um, mean, very, uh, very few. I uh, don't know of any. Had it's all the only one I know. We've had several certificates, but but not in the master's degree program. And and you are right, Betsy. And thank you for encouraging Nicole. Uh, I, I also chair the subcommittee for our global grants scholarships in District 6270. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in that for over eight years now. And I, I can affirm that our best qualified candidates for both Rotary Peace Fellowships and for the Global Grant Scholarships come from recommendations, referrals from local Rotarians. That has consistently been the case. 
So thank you, Betsy, for pushing. Oh, it's my pleasure. To it's apply. my pleasure. We're just so proud. We and Nina here are so proud um, to have Nicole representing us and our Rotary Club and our district over in Japan. I actually have a question on that end, if you don't mind me cutting sure. in. So I appreciate um, the um, constant reminder that this program was something that I could do. Um, but I think for me, the main thing in not going for this uh, program at first was my concern about the uh, years of peace experience, peace related work experience um, that it that was required to uh, attend the program. So somebody like, am I am I wrong in that somebody who just graduated from university would find it difficult to apply for the program. That's correct. Or would it it, it requires three years of experience for the master's degree program and even more for the certificate program. The certificate program doesn't get you a degree, it gets you a certificate. It's not as lengthy. It's, it's a 12-month program, but it's tailor-made for individuals who are already steep in their career. And because of that, that particular certificate program requires five years of experience. So yes, if you're just a, a, a senior in college and looking for graduate studies, Rotary Peace Fellowship is not for you, but our Global Grant Scholarship Program could be a fit for you, but not the Rotary Peace Fellowship. So yeah, three years for the master's programs, uh, uh, five years for the certificate programs mm -hmm. for experience. Thank you. Well, and thank we're you, Nicole. So glad, we're just so glad you applied, Nicole. <laughs> and again, <laughs> we're just so thrilled. We're thrilled to, to have you as our ambassador over there. And we had not mentioned at the beginning, but uh, 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 Nicole's own undergraduate experience was at Wheaton uh, College uh, down in Illinois. And so that's where she did her undergraduate work and then went out from there. She already had international experience during collegiate and was mentioned that the Rotary Exchange students uh, had, who had been in their home. So uh, she she has been preparing for this for a long time. She didn't know that she was, but she was. So right. we're glad we're glad that it's happening. Exactly. So thanks to both of you for doing this, and uh, we we really appreciate that. So uh, thank you extremely.